Welcome to the podcast, Buffy and the Art of Stories, Season 3. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. I am Lisa M. Lilly, author of the Awakening Supernatural Thriller series and the QC Davis Mysteries and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. This Monday, we are talking about Season 3, Episode 16, Doppelgangland. In particular, I'll look at whether the first scene is a prologue, if Willow is both the protagonist and antagonist of this episode, a very subtle episode midpoint, and the use of subplots and story questions to keep viewers coming back. As always, there will be no spoilers except at the end to talk about foreshadowing, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Doppelgangland first aired on February 23, 1999, and it was written and directed by Joss Whedon. We start as we should with opening conflict. This first scene could be considered a prologue. It does relate to our main conflict, however, fairly directly. Anya begs the demon Dahafren to restore her power, which she lost. And she argues he should do it because she wielded the power of the wish for over a thousand years, bringing ruin to unfaithful men. And she was feared and worshipped. She follows up with a summary of her current situation. And now I'm stuck at Sunnydale High, mortal, a child, and I'm flunking math. She says all de Hoffren will need to do is fold the fabric of time, but he tells her she lost her power through her own carelessness, so he is not going to help. Her time is done. And Anya vows by the pestilent gods to find another way to get her power center back. And if he won't help her, she'll find someone who will. Such a great example of exposition coming out through conflict. We have learned so much about Anya, that she was a vengeance demon, that she lost her power center, that Tehofren is somehow part of that, and that she was around for over a thousand years. So is this the start of our plot or a prologue? I had to really think about this. I see this as a prologue because our main story won't really be Anya trying to get her power center back. That is more of a subplot. The main plot is Willow dealing with herself and her darker self, Vampire Willow. But whether we call this a prologue or not, it works because it propels us into the main story. So I don't feel the way I do with some prologues where I wish the writers would just drop it or I want to just skip over it and get to the beginning of the story. While you could omit this and the episode would still work, it definitely adds to the suspense because we know this is going on in the background. And we won't see Anya again until a quarter way through. So I feel like that does add a lot here. After this, we're only at 1 minute 16 seconds in, and we switch to Willow outside under the trees with Buffy. Buffy's doing sit-ups, and Willow is floating a pencil in the air. And she tells Buffy that doing it is all about emotional control and, of course, magic. And she asks why Buffy is working so hard and says, aren't you sort of naturally buff, Buff? Buffy explains about the Watcher's Council, which is doing testing of her and Faith, and it includes psychological testing as well as physical testing, including her reflexes, and she sort of trails off and Willow guesses that Buffy is working hard because she wants to do better than Faith, and Buffy looks down and says, so very shallow, but Willow responds, Competition is natural and healthy. Plus, you'll definitely ace her on the psych test. Just don't mark the box that says, I sometimes like to kill people. And Buffy tells her, I know Faith's not going to be on the cover of Sanity Fair, but she had it rough. In different circumstances, that could be me. I find it so interesting that Buffy in this scene has her hair in a single braid, much like it was in The Wish. 
it can't be an accident because they're having this conversation that really does touch on the wish because Willow now says there's no way Buffy could be like that. Some people just don't have it in them. And yet in the wish, we saw Buffy in that alternate universe where she was very much the stake or kill first um, and not even ask questions later, just don't bother asking questions, which is quite a bit like Faith. And of course, this foreshadows our current episode where Willow will be confronting another version of herself from that same universe. And we also get in those few lines so much exposition. We know there's another Slayer. We know that the Watcher's Council is testing Buffy and Faith. So Faith is still thought to be sort of in the Slayer Watcher's Council fold and that they are trying to address whatever issues Faith has, and Buffy has mixed feelings about that. That is such an amazing amount to get in through a few dialogue lines that are so interesting in themselves. Buffy now apologizes for talking about Faith because she knows it upsets Willow. Willow claims it doesn't, but the camera shifts, and we see that pencil, which had just been floating there in the air, is now spinning around and around, and it shoots forward and embeds in the tree bark and we go to credits when we return willow is in principal snyder's office another student is sitting next to her and snyder says as far as he's concerned this is a marriage made in heaven willow rosenberg despite her unsavory associations is the pinnacle of academic achievement and percy west has a devastating fast break and 50% from behind the three-point line. We'll see later why Willow's name is, her last name is mentioned. Willow is confused. She says, Match, you want us to breed? No, Snyder wants her to tutor Percy, who is flunking history, and nothing seems to motivate him. And Percy says, hey, I'm challenged. Snyder responds, hmm, you're lazy, self-involved, and spoiled. That's quite the challenge. But he says they can't lose their point guard. They need the basketball team to have a winning season, especially after the debacle with the swim team last year. A nice callback to go fish. We are now about 10% through the story. This is where typically we'll see the story spark or inciting incident that gets the main plot rolling. And this is part of why I do not think the main plot here is Anya getting her power center back. Before I sat down to outline the episode for the podcast, I made a guess as to what I thought the story spark would be, and I thought it was going to be Anya asking Willow for help with the spell to get her pendant back. And instead, it is right here, 4 minutes 49 seconds in, this conversation between Principal Snyder and Willow, because he tells her she is going to take on this teaching job of tutoring Percy She says she has a lot of work of her own, and she clearly doesn't want to do this. But Snyder looks at her and says he knows she'll do it. Ask him how he knows. And she starts to ask, and he just stares her down and says, I just know. So I see the main conflict here as Willow versus Willow. Because as we'll see for much of the beginning of the episode, Willow keeps going along with what other people tell her to do. So we cut from Snyder saying, I just know, to Buffy and Willow walking into the library. And Buffy says, so he threatened you with what? Willow tells Buffy it wasn't exactly what he said. It was all in his eyes and a little bit of nostril work. And she goes on to say she hates the way he bullies people. He assumes everyone's time is his. Giles walks out of his office at that moment and says, Willow, get on the computer. I want you to take another pass at accessing the mayor's files. Willow puts down her backpack and says, okay. At first, I saw this as just a funny line. But like so much of the humor in Buffy, it reflects 
the theme and the main conflict here, which is that Willow lives up to other people's expectations, whether or not they have the right to impose them and whether or not she really wants to do it. Here, I think that she wants to help Giles, but she is still angry about Snyder pushing her to tutor Percy. And Giles echoes that by just assuming Willow will do what he needs. Faith walks in. She's wearing a white tank top and workout clothes. Wesley enters behind her. He is really worn out, breathing hard. He says Faith did great on her endurance test. And despite his gasping, he agrees that he'll take Buffy out next. We then get a little more exposition through conflict. And Faith says... You're going to love it, B. It's just like fun, only boring. Giles tells her faith. This evaluation is a necessary part of the council's. And she cuts him off. She looks really contrite. And she says, I know, I'm on board here. Just shooting my mouth off. This is a great example of what I mentioned last week, that perhaps faith is good at lying. Giles said she was not, but she is lying here, playing the part of the prodigal slayer returned to the fold. Now Faith asks what Willow is working on when Willow opens the computer. Willow says she's trying to get in the mayor's personal files. Faith asks if she can really do that, and Willow says eventually. And we cut to the mayor. He and Faith are at a beautiful large apartment that he found for her and is renting for her. And he says that's very interesting. Obviously, uh, she has just told him about Willow's efforts. But Faith is so excited about this apartment. She can't believe she gets to live there. It is such a contrast to the motel where she was. It emphasizes how the council never cared where Faith lived or did anything to try to make her life better. The whole scene is part of this running subplot and through line of the mayor and Faith relationship, which is one of the things that keeps us returning for the rest of the season. And it goes a long way to seeing why Faith becomes so devoted to the mayor. He tells her he doesn't like that hotel where she's staying. It has an unsavory reputation, lots of immoral liaisons going on there, to which Faith responds, yeah, plus all the screwing. She jumps on the bed and then returns to the mayor, stands close to him, facing him, smiling, and says, thanks, sugar daddy. And Mayor says, now, Faith, I don't find that sort of thing amusing. I'm a family man. And it's good to see him turn aside any suggestion of sexual favors. And she's so happy. I almost like the mayor in this moment. And then, as so often in Buffy, the tone turns on a dime and the mayor says, now, let's kill your little friend. Faith freezes. And he says, don't worry, he won't ask her to do it, not so early in the relationship. Besides, a vampire attack would look less suspicious. Faith still looks troubled, but the mayor tells her she should look around some more, that some lucky girl has a PlayStation, and she's very excited and happy again. We're now at 7 minutes 59 seconds in. Oz and Willow are walking in the hall, and he mentions a gig his band had in Monterey. Willow's upset that he didn't tell her about it. She might have liked to go, and Oz says he didn't think she'd want to miss school. And Willow says, you think I'm boring. Oz responds, I'd call that a radical interpretation of the text. But he tells her his band is playing the bronze that night. So maybe she can come, and she reluctantly says she can't. She has too much homework, and he tells her if she gets done early, she should come. Outside, Willow catches up with Percy. She wants to talk about the books he'll need and getting started on tutoring. He asks her what she's talking about, and she says his paper on President Roosevelt. And Percy responds, oh, yeah, yeah, Snyder said you were going to do it. Willow says he never said that, and Percy answers, what meeting were you at? And tells her to type up the paper, put his name on it, but don't type too good, dead giveaway. And I have in my notes, ugh, with multiple exclamation points, because there's so much about that. Uh, Percy's just taking for granted Willow will do the work, and probably that is what Snyder meant, 
but also this idea that, oh, what she's really good at is typing. That's the key thing here. On the other hand, uh, it could be just that Percy knows a lot about cheating and how bad his usual work looks. Willow sits down on a bench. She takes a banana out of her backpack and says to herself she's eating it and she doesn't care that it's not lunchtime. Xander and Buffy walk over and ask if she remembered to tape a TV show. When she says she did, Buffy calls her old reliable. Willow is definitely not thrilled with that and says maybe she doesn't want to be old reliable anymore. Xander keeps trying to fix it, but everything he says makes it worse and Buffy begs him not to help her. Willow grabs her things and says they don't know. Maybe she's not just some doormat person, homework gal. Maybe she'll change her look or cut class. She stalks away. Buffy follows her to apologize, but Willow says, Buff, I'm storming off. It doesn't really work if you come with me. Now we are at about one quarter of the way through the episode. At 10 minutes 47 seconds, Anya approaches Willow and introduces herself. Anya says she needs help to do a spell, and she heard Willow was the person to ask. Willow asks if it's dangerous and Anya playing it down says no and Willow says well could we pretend it is? So usually about a quarter way through any novel and anywhere from a quarter way to a third of the way through a screenplay we see the first major plot turn that comes from outside the protagonist spins the story in a new direction and raises the stakes and here right around that time Anya and Willow are in an empty classroom preparing to do this spell. Anya explains it will create a teensy temporal fold so she can get back her necklace that she lost which she calls a family heirloom. They say the words of the spell, Willow and Anya facing each other. They're holding a glass container of sand. But as they say the words, there's flashing light, and Willow sees flashes from the world of the wish, including Buffy staking Xander, Anya as the scary, veiny demon Anyanka, Giles smashing the pendant, the cage in the warehouse filled with humans, and Willow, we can see she's not willing to turn that container over and pour out the sand. Her hand is kind of fighting Anya's. Anya manages to tip over the sand, And we get more flashing light and the moment in the wish where Oz is lunging for vampire Willow, who then disappears. We're back in the classroom and Willow, shaken, takes a really deep breath. Anya's upset and angry that her necklace isn't there and wants to try again. But Willow says, okay, that's a little blacker than I like my arts. And she asks what that was and she knows it's not just a temporal fold, it's some weird hell place. Anya swears she's just trying to find her necklace and Willow in one of my favorite lines says, did you try looking inside the sofa in hell? She refuses to try again and when Anya says she can't do it by herself, Willow says that's a relief. Willow gathers her supplies saying, I believe these chicken feet are mine. Look, magic is dangerous, Anya. It's not to be toyed with. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have someone else's homework to do. Anya calls her an idiot child, and after Willow leaves, shouts and breaks the plate they were using that had a drawing of the necklace on it. At 14 minutes, 18 seconds in, in the now empty warehouse, Vampire Willow from the Wish universe appears and says, This is weird. So this all truly spins that story and definitely raised the stakes because Vampire Willow is dangerous. So this is a nice escalation of the conflict at that one quarter point because first we have Anya asking Willow and we know Anya has an agenda Willow doesn't know about and then the Willow is frightened by the spell, refuses, and then Vampire Willow. The scene cuts. We return. It's night. Vampire Willow walks down Sunnydale's main street. She growls at an old woman who asks her for help. And she gets to the bronze where a band is playing. If you find the story structure discussed 
in the podcast helpful and would like a copy of Story Structure Worksheets to use for your own writing or to take apart other stories you love, you can download them at the link in the show notes. If you would like to join those who support the show on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, you can do that at patreon.com slash L Lily. That's double L I double L Y. At the $5 level, you will also get a copy of my book, Super Simple Story Structure, a quick guide to plotting and writing your novel. You can also help the show find new listeners by telling a friend who loves Buffy about it or sharing it on social media. And I love hearing comments from listeners. You can email me, lisa at lisalily.com, or tweet me at Lisa Amazon Marie Lily hashtag Buffy Story. And we do have a new listener comment today. Tiffany D. Niehauser or Nyheiser, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, on Twitter said that um, I'm new to the podcast Buffy and the Art of Story by Lisa M. Lilly, but it's so good. First, I love revisiting Buffy in a new way, but second, it's a sneaky way to review story structure and storytelling techniques. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm so glad you are enjoying the podcast. And I love your comment on it being a sneaky way to delve into story and story structure because I have always found that the best way to learn anything for me from grammar rules to story structure, anything about writing is by looking closely at what I'm reading and the stories I'm consuming. Vampire Willow knows this is not right. She's wearing the tight black leather outfit we saw in The Wish, and she moves despite being confused with so much confidence and so much um, overt sexuality. Percy sees her, and interestingly, because it is so in his mind sort of who Willow is, he doesn't respond to that. Instead, he says, Rosenberg, what are you doing? Trick or treating? A line that comments so much on how when a person tries to change, often the reaction of other people who continue to see them the same way keeps them from moving forward or, or sets up an obstacle. I realize this isn't really Willow here, but if it were she would be getting this kind of pushback. Also, it's just Percy is focused on himself, and he says she's supposed to be doing his history report, and he warns her if he flunks, she's in big trouble. And Vampire Willow says, bored now, smacks him across the room, and then walks toward him and says she's having a terrible night, and asks, want to make it better? grabs Percy by the neck. He reaches up, grabs her, trying to get her to let go. Xander comes in, and he thinks Percy attacked Willow, so he yanks Percy away and tells him to stay away from Willow. Vampire Willow is so thrilled to see Xander. She just lets Percy go, and he stumbles off, agreeing he won't come near her again. Xander takes in Willow and says, wow, changing the look, not an idle threat with you. Vampire Willow smiles and says, Xander, you're alive. And she hugs him and presses really close to him. And he jumps back and says, hands, hands in new places. And Vampire Willow says, you're alive. Now Buffy comes in. She starts to talk to Xander and ask him to introduce her to his friend, then looks a second time and says, holy God, you're Willow. And Vamp Willow says, you. Buffy backpedals saying, you know what? I, I like the look. It's um, extreme, but it looks good. It's a leather thing. I said extreme already, right? And Vamp Willow responds, I don't like you and stalks off. At 18 minutes, 20 seconds in, Buffy goes after her, touches her arm, trying to apologize. Vamp Willow shoves Buffy away, vamps out, and says, get off me. Buffy and Xander 
watch her leave devastated. Outside the bronze, a voice asks Vamp Willow if she's Willow Rosenberg. This is, I think, why we get the reference to Willow's last name, because these vamps would want to make sure this is the right Willow. When she says she is, two vampires attack her and get a big surprise because she fights back. She gets one of them pinned on the ground, tells him he made her cranky. He says this was a mistake. They were sent after a human. Vampire Willow says, really? Who do you work for? And the vamp says, I'm not telling you a thing. She breaks one of his fingers and says, who do you work for? And he responds, Wilkins, the mayor. But Vamp Willow smiles, breaks two more of his fingers and says, who do you work for? And the vampire says, you. Really nice three beat, which is where you have the same type of event or the same line said three different ways meaning different things and often the third one subverts or changes the whole tone or point of the prior two which we definitely have here because who do you work for becomes yes she now has the information the first two times she's trying to get information now she's making a point that he needs to follow her. She lets him up, tells him to get his friends. They're going to change things and make the world the way it was. We're at 19 minutes, 47 seconds in, very close to the midpoint of the episode. That is where typically we see a protagonist, the protagonist, commit in full to the quest, throw caution to the wind, or suffer a major reversal. And sometimes we have seen an antagonist fully commit to the quest around here. Very interesting that approaching that midpoint, we have Vampire Willow committing to a quest. She is going to turn the world into what she wants. Buffy and Xander walk into the library in the next scene. They are so downcast. Giles asks, what is it? And we cut to all three sitting on the stairs. And Giles says, she was truly the finest of all of us. And Xander agrees, saying, way better than me. And Giles says, much, much better. And he does it so seriously, and this is such a funny line, and it only works because we know that Willow's not really dead. This was such a nice way to handle this, so we don't get Buffy and Xander telling Giles what happened. We just get the three trying to absorb the shock and make sense of it. Xander is saying it's all his fault. Buffy says it's hers. She's the one who called Willow reliable. And Willow never would have done whatever she did that she ended up getting attacked if Buffy hadn't done that. And Buffy says, and now my best friend is... Willow has walked in off screen. We see her. She's wearing a skirt and a fuzzy pink sweater. And she says, what's going on? Jeez, who died? They all stare at her in shock. And she says, oh, God, who died? Xander yells back, lunges toward her with this giant cross, and is puzzled when it has no effect. Willow is even more puzzled. And Buffy says, Willow, you're alive. And Willow says, aren't I usually? Buffy hugs her really hard. So does Xander. Willow turns to Giles to ask what's going on, but he too hugs her really hard. And Willow says, say, you didn't all happen to do a lot of drugs, did you? At 21 minutes, 50 seconds in, so a little bit past the midpoint, because our episodes are generally 43 to 44 minutes long, they tell her that she was a vampire. We get some really fun lines where Buffy asks Giles if he's planning on jumping in with an explanation anytime soon, and Giles says, well, uh, something something, um, very strange is going on. And Xander says, can you believe the Watcher's Council let this guy go? It is very subtle, but I see this Willow learning that there is a vampire Willow out there as a reversal for Willow. Which brings me to, I've been talking about these plot points without getting to who is the protagonist here and who is the antagonist. Our protagonist should be the character who actively pursues a goal, is the main viewpoint character, and has the most at stake. 
we know here it's not Buffy. She has a goal in the running season subplot between her and Faith to do better than Faith on these tests. But that isn't what this episode is mainly about. So the two characters who have goals here and actively pursue them are Willow and Anya. Anya wants to get her power center back. Now, if the episode spent most of the time on that, then that first scene wouldn't be a prologue. It would be part of the main plot. And Anya does actively pursue that. She starts by trying to get to Hoffren to give her her power back. Then she goes to Willow for help. And we'll see her continuing in the episode to try to get her world back, the wish world back, or at least to go back into that reality to get her power center. Willow's goal starts out in reaction to Buffy and Xander. They set it off by calling her old reliable. And obviously before that, she was pushed by Snyder, by Giles. Um, and Willow storms off and says, you don't know. I might change my look. She is starting to feel frustrated with what she sees as her role in life. And throughout the episode, she will become more and more active in pursuit of this goal of, of figuring out how can she be different? How can she take more charge of her life? That isn't as clear a goal as Anya's, but the next part of being a protagonist is being the main viewpoint character. And here we spend relatively little time in Anya's viewpoint. She's important, but we are clearly not following her through the story. And then we get to who has the most at stake. So you can argue Anya has much more at stake. She was a demon for a thousand years. She now is a schoolgirl. But because we spend so much time with Willow and she is the character we care most about, her well-being, her sense of self is at stake here. And that is a huge thing for Willow. So I see her as our protagonist, and that also fits with each of these plot turns. Now, who is the antagonist? The antagonist is the character or force that pushes back against the protagonist throughout the story. A lot of characters are pushing against Willow at different points in the episode, we have Vampire Willow, who is going to oppose what Willow is trying to do. Anya, Snyder, Percy, to a lesser extent, the mayor and Faith. And even Buffy, Xander, and Giles, to the extent they see Willow as old reliable. For the action aspect of the plot, the main two are Anya and Vampire Willow. But note that for neither of them is opposing Willow the mangle. Anya, I'm sure, could care less about Willow's development of self, about the issues Willow is struggling with. She just wants her pendant back. So opposing Willow is more of a byproduct of that. Vampire Willow, she does become somewhat interested in Willow Willow. But her main goal is either to get back to her world or to remake this world. So Willow is, again, almost a byproduct of that. So fascinating that in this episode where Willow is struggling with how other people see her, how she later will say she lets them walk all over her, even our forces of evil are not taking Willow very seriously. They don't, they aren't that concerned about her. So what is the antagonist here? You could say it is everyone's view of Willow, how everybody sees Willow, but I think it is really Willow's own self, her choices, and her choices will change in the episode because she will push herself and she will recognize things about herself. And of course, the, the appearance of her doppelganger, Vampire Willow, is a reflection of that, that this whole episode is Willow pushing against herself. So all of that is why I see this discovery of Vampire Willow Willow learning that her vampire self is terrorizing people and that Willow was instrumental in bringing that vampire self into this universe 
is a major reversal for Willow. She won't recognize that part of it until later, but it is key. Without Willow, Anya could not have done this. So now we switch to the bronze. Anya is there, so we do get a little Anya. She is trying to get a beer, but she doesn't have an ID showing she's 21. And she slaps the bar in frustration when the bartender asks for the ID and says she's 1120 years old. The bartender is unimpressed, asks again for her ID, and she orders a Coke. Oz and his band are setting up. An angel appears. He's looking for Buffy. And then a group of vampires comes in. They're um, throwing people around. And this male vampire yells to everyone to shut up. Don't leave and no one will get hurt. An angel says to Oz, why don't I believe him? Oz says, well, he lacks credibility. And then he asks Angel if he can get out to go get Buffy. And Angel says there's a skylight in the roof, but he's needed here. Then Vampire Willow strolls in. Anya, we get this very quick shot of her. You can almost miss it where she stands up, watches Vampire Willow walk in, and she gets right away what's going on. Vamp Willow says, look, everyone's all afraid. It's just like old times. And Oz tells Angel, get Buffy, do it now. Willow goes up to a girl, asks her name. It's Sandy. And Willow tells Sandy, uh, I think she's stroking her hair, that she doesn't have to be afraid. She just needs to please Willow. And tells the crowd, if they're all good, she'll make them young and strong forever. And if they're not, and she bites Sandy and drops her to the ground. Oz tries to go to Willow. The other vampires hold him back. But he says she doesn't want to do this. She's confused. Vampire Willow is confused for a different reason. She recognizes him as one of the white hats, which was the term from the wish for the people who tried to fight vampires, and asks why he's talking to her like they're friends. And I don't think it's an accident that we use the white hat, black hat terminology. It is a callback to the wish, but it also fits that we are either seeing or referencing good and evil versions of so many of our characters Anya intervenes and she points out that this isn't Willow's reality telling her that Oz thinks she's the Willow from this world and Vamp Willow says another me she wants her world back and Anya says she knows who can help send Vampire Willow back we switch again to the library Angel enters breathing hard and he says, Buffy, I, something's happened that Willow's dead. Buffy and Xander nod and Willow, who was standing a little off to the side, steps forward. Angel glances at her and says, hey, Willow. And then he looks at Xander and Buffy. Xander's eyebrows raise and Angel says, wait a second. Xander responds, we're right there with you, buddy. And I like this little bit of bonding between Xander and Angel, which we get so rarely. Angel tells them they need to stop the group of vampires at the bronze. And as they all head out, someone asks if they should call Faith. But Giles rejects the idea. He doesn't want her in combat yet, not around civilians. And Xander says, hear, hear. Willow questions what they're going to do with Vampire Willow. And then she says she needs to get something. She'll catch up with them. She goes back to the library. So this question, which will be echoed more than once later in the episode, is another reason I see the main plot here and the protagonist antagonist as Willow versus Willow. Because we get multiple references to Vampire Willow as Willow's self or as vampire willow says another me in the library vampire willow grabs willow and says alone at last and we cut at 27 minutes 56 seconds in vampire willow looks over willow and says well look at me i'm all fuzzy she tells willow that anya said willow could get vampire willow back to her world and this is when it hits willow that the spell she did with anya is what brought vampire willow here 
But now Vampire Willow is having second thoughts. She likes the idea of the two of them. They could be quite a team if Willow came around to her way of thinking. And she's standing behind Willow and she licks Willow's neck and says, what do you say? Want to be bad? Articulating the key question for Willow in this episode in a, a very nuanced way. Part of the question or the dilemma for Willow I see as Willow sees doing what other people want, meeting their expectations as being good, as being what she's supposed to do, but then she's angry about it. And if you see standing up for yourself as bad, that obviously can lead to a lot of issues. And I feel like Willow is struggling to define good and bad, who she is, where she will draw the line, and having problems with that. So Vampire Willow saying you want to be bad has so much in there because it encompasses what does Willow think of as bad. But also Vampire Willow, much as Faith does for Buffy, shows what is life like if you're no longer troubled by what's good and what's bad and you just do what you want. Nobody pushes Vampire Willow around. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by How to Write a Novel Grades 6 through 8. If you have a creative child or student or you know one who loves to write and might enjoy taking their ideas or stories and turning them into novels, this is a great gift, especially during a time when many people's kids have to be at home more and are looking for for exciting things to do. How to Write a Novel Grades 6 through 8 is available in ebook or workbook forms. And there is a link in the show notes. Or you can find them through writingasasecondcareer.com or at my author website, lisalily.com where you will also find all my writing, um, nonfiction and fiction alike. Willow tries to hold Vampire Willow off with a cross, not very successfully because Vamp Willow knocks her over the counter and walks around and she's advancing, but Willow has gotten the tranquilizer gun and shoots Vamp Willow, knocking her out. In the next scene, our friends are all there. They are locking Vampire Willow into the book cage and Willow says, that's me as a vampire? I'm so evil and skanky, and I think I'm kind of gay. Buffy tells her a vamp's personality has nothing to do with the humans. Angel says, well, actually, and Buffy looks at him and he finishes, that's a good point. So we have a change in vampire lore here. In uh, earlier episodes, particularly Lie to Me, when Buffy was confronting her friend Ford, who was dying and wanted to be turned into a vampire she tells him this demon sets up shop in your body and it walks and it talks and it has your memories but it's not you now we are maybe expanding on that or morphing that concept a bit to say that yes who you are does inform who your vampire self is They're planning to leave Vampire Willow in the cage to go to the bronze. Angel says that the other vampires might wait for Vamp Willow to come back, but vampires aren't notoriously reliable. So another link between Willow and Vamp Willow, this idea of reliable and not. They're not sure about leaving Vampire Willow there, even locked up, and then Buffy has what she calls a really bad idea. The next scene takes place outside the bronze. Willow is wearing Vampire Willow's leather outfit. She's clearly uncomfortable in it. She talks about it being binding. And she looks down at her breasts, which are pushed up by this outfit and says, gosh, look at those. Giles says, um, clears his throat and then starts talking about her going into the bronze. Just really trying to ignore this. The plan is Willow will go in 
as Vampire Willow and try to get as many of the vampires inside to go out where Buffy and Angel and Giles can stake them. Willow promises not to do anything too brave and she'll give the signal if she's in trouble. Xander asks what the signal is and Willow says, me screaming. So now we're approaching the three-quarter point in the episode. Usually we get another major plot turn here. It grows from the midpoint, yet spins the story in another new direction. I see Willow impersonating Vampire Willow as that three-quarter turn. So in a way, it grows from the midpoint in the sense of Willow realizing there that there was this other self of hers in this reality. But you see more of a progression there, you know, realizing the other self, accepting it's true, then being confronted by Vampire Willow, taking her down knocking her out, and then deciding to impersonate her. So it is a really nice step-by-step build to this moment. Vampire Willow knocks on the door. Um, She's let in, and she tells the vampire who opened the door, she says, hi, I'm back. Way too friendly. But he just asks if she found the girl, and Willow says yes. And Anya asks where the girl is, and Willow says she killed her and sucked her blood, as we vampires do. And then she turns to that vampire who opened the door and says, you know, I think maybe I heard something out there. Why don't you go check? She sounds so Willow-like. But here we're seeing that same effect when Vampire Willow walked into the bronze, so much confidence, so sexy, and Percy said, oh, what, what, it's trick or treat? Because he saw Willow Willow. And here the vampire and Anya both are seeing Vampire Willow. So they initially accept Willow, even though she hasn't quite got the persona down yet. Outside, Buffy stakes the vampire Anya asks Willow inside, why did she kill the girl who was the only way back? And and Willow gets more into character now and says she doesn't like that Anya dares to question her. And maybe she'll have her minions take Anya out back and kill her horribly. And she gives a little wave to Oz. A nice moment of her integrating, in a way, these two parts of herself. At first, Anya shrugs this off as vampires always thinking with their teeth. And Willow goes on to say the girl bothered her. She was so weak, always letting people walk all over her. And then she got cranky with her friends. So interesting, Willow now is recognizing her own role in being that person who does what everyone else wants. That, yeah, she is feeling like a doormat and it's partly because she is going along with that and that she doesn't have to. She sends another vampire outside and then the lead guy vampire says, well, you know, if the girl's not coming back, let's get on with the killing. We cut to Vampire Willow. We're at 32 minutes, 51 seconds in. She wakes up in the cage, pulls on the sweater as she looks down at it and says, oh no, this is like a nightmare. Cordelia walks in wearing what I can only describe as an evening dress, very sparkly, very form-fitting, and she calls out for Wesley and says she just happened to stop by for some books. Vamp Willow pretends she is Willow and locked herself in. Cordelia looks for the keys, but before opening the cage, says it occurs to her that they've never really had the opportunity to talk. And Cordelia says, you know, woman to woman, with you locked up. And she suggests they talk about the ethics of boyfriend stealing. We switch back to the bronze, and Willow tells the other vampires that just killing everyone, where's the fun in that? It would be like shooting fish in a barrel. And she suggests giving people a head start, which is really nicely done because remember, Vampire Willow liked the chase and she liked playing with Angel as the puppy torturing him. Anya, however, is realizing what's up. So Willow agrees they should start killing and they should start with Anya. 
We go back to Cordelia sitting on a chair as Vampire Willow slumps in the cage looking very bored. And Cordelia goes on about how she wasn't even that attracted to Xander. It's just that she kept being put in these life-threatening situations and that's always all sexy. Vampire Willow apologizes. She realizes she was wrong and says, I'll never steal your boyfriend again. Cordelia says, like you could, and says she should leave Willow in there, but she's a great humanitarian and Willow will just have to think of a way to pay her back. She opens the cage, Vampire Willow vamps out and says, okay, how about dinner? Wesley is walking through the hall. He hears Cordelia scream and drops his briefcase. Cordelia runs, Willow follows her eventually into the girls' room, corners her, but Wesley comes in at the last minute and wards her off. He has a cross and a holy water. His hands are shaking. No way do we think he could really hurt vampire Willow, but she rolls her eyes, says whatever, and leaves. I I do kind of buy this because I feel like attacking Cordelia and dealing with Wesley just isn't worth the trouble to Vamp Willow. She wants to get back to uh, Willow Willow herself. Wesley screams when Cordelia touches his arm and she apologizes and then hugs him saying he saved her life. And Wesley looks after the departing vampire and says, was that? And Cordelia answers, Willow. They got Willow. Then she turns to him, changes tone, and says, So you doing anything tonight? We're now at 38 minutes in. At the bronze, Anya is saying that Willow is human. And Willow says, I'm a blood-sucking fiend. Look at my outfit. And then when Anya persists, Willow says, A human? Oh, yeah? Could a human do this? And she screams really loud, giving the signal. And we get a funny moment when Anya and the guy vampire both say, Sure, yeah, I think, yeah, humans do that. We are now at the climax where our opposing forces have their final clash and resolve the conflict. There is a ton of fighting here. Willow punches Anya and hurts her hand. Vampire Willow attacks Willow Willow. There is fighting between Angel and Vamps, Buffy and Vamps. Uh, Xander even gets a vampire to fight. It takes a long time, so it is not realistic that Vampire Willow, who has gotten Willow on the floor, Vamp Willow's on top of her, her hands around Willow's throat, there's no reason it would take that long for her to kill Willow Willow. But two things could be happening there. One, that Vampire Willow isn't that comfortable killing herself. But also, I think we go with it because it is symbolic. Again, this whole episode is Willow versus Willow. So finally, Buffy has a pull cue. She sees what's happening. She jumps on the stage and is about to stake Vamp Willow from behind. Willow says, Buffy, no. Buffy stops at the last second and just pulls Vampire Willow away. Willow says, nice reflexes. And Buffy responds, well, I work out. And this is one of many reasons I love doing this podcast because I probably have watched the entire series at least a dozen times over the years. And I never noticed before that in the beginning, one of the things Buffy mentions working on for the Watcher's Council testing is her reflexes. And now we get that nice reflexes mention. And Buffy has used that to refrain from killing Vamp Willow. Now we're in the falling action section of the story. That's where the writers tie up loose ends and resolve any subplots. Vampire Willow looks at Willow and says, this world's no fun. And Willow says, you notice that too? Which is very interesting that they bond on this and it does echo what we've seen willow had that fear that oz thought she was boring she doesn't want to be old reliable vampire willow has said bored now and look very bored when cordelia was talking to her so this lack of fun It means different things to them, but it is also part of what was driving Willow. She, throughout the beginning of the episode, she wanted to have seen Oz's band play. She wanted to go that night to the bronze, and all these things other people she felt were putting on her were keeping her from doing anything fun. 
We also get a nice reference to Vampire Xander in the Wish universe because he turns to Vampire Willow as they're preparing the spell and says, so in your reality, I'm like this badass vampire, huh? She just rolls her eyes at him. Buffy is not so sure about sending Vampire Willow back, but Willow says she just can't kill her, and Buffy says she can't either. Willow says at least this way, Vampire Willow has a chance. The spell is done. We see a flash of light again, and Vampire Willow is returned to the exact moment she disappeared from. She's in front of that wooden cage, and as in the wish, Oz shoves her back into a protruding wooden board, and she dusts. So in this episode, we have seen or referenced at least four doppelgangers. Willow, obviously. Anya, because we did briefly see her demon self. And Buffy, that echo of Buffy with the braid looking a little like she did in The Wish. And we got the flash of Buffy staking vampire Xander. Only Giles and Oz were pretty much the same in terms of personality in both universes. And Angel, too, I guess, had the same personality. He was obviously in a much different position because he was in chains and being tortured. But who he was was essentially the same, which is is just interesting, probably thought for some uh, future episodes or if I had a whole side bonus episode about why is it that we see four of them radically different in the universe of The Wish and then these others essentially the same. In our last scene, Buffy and Willow are sitting in the sun on a bench under a tree. Buffy asks Willow if she wants to go out that night. And Willow says, strangely, I feel like staying home and doing my homework and flossing and dying a virgin. Buffy tells her she can overdo virtue. But Willow says her evil twin messed up everything she touched and she never wants to be like that. Which makes me wonder, well, how much has Willow learned and grown here? Because she still seems to be seeing things as either or. Either she does everything that everyone thinks she's supposed to do, or at least doesn't take any chances. Or she's at the other end being evil and vampire Willow. But we did see her grow during this and be able to be more assertive and recognize things about herself. So now we see an externalized moment that I think is meant to tell us that Willow is willing to embrace a little of this change because now she sees some benefit to that show of strength and power facing down or standing up to someone who was trying to walk all over her even though it was vampire willow that did this because percy comes up willow starts to apologize for not getting to his paper but he instead hands her two papers tells her it turns out there are two president roosevelt's and he didn't know which one so he did two papers and he typed out a bibliography which he says he can retype if she wants and he starts to leave but then he returns to perch an apple on top of the papers and disappears and buffy says you want to go out tonight and willow says nine sound good And that is the end of the episode. It is such a great conclusion. It wraps up the whole story. But we do have quite a number of story questions to keep us returning through the season. One is just how will Willow be going forward? She's definitely grown and changed here, but what will that mean? Wesley and Cordelia, there's that little romantic subplot. Faith and Buffy. Buffy still thinks Faith is on her side, or at least that Faith is trying to be on her side. And of course, what are the mayor's plans for Sunnydale and Buffy? Sometimes I talk about commentary from the DVD editions. There was no commentary this time. But I do have something from one of the books I have on Buffy, Fighting the Forces, What's at Stake in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. From the essay, Buffy's Mary Sue is Jonathan, Buffy Acknowledges the Fans, by Justine Larbalestier. 
And she saw the Wish and Doppelgang land as driven partly by fans, in service to the fans. She thought that often the alternate universe episodes were in response to that, and this one particularly in What If Willow Met Vampire Willow. She saw this parallel between the two episodes that I wish I had picked up on and didn't. So let me read you this passage from page 230. When Vamp Willow arrives in the normal continuum of the Buffyverse, she is as confused and disconcerted by the new world as Cordelia was when thrust into the alternate reality of a Sunnydale without its slayer. The two are directly paralleled. In The Wish, Cordelia, increasingly anxious, walks along the dark main street of Sunnydale, emptied of humans by the curfew. In Doppelgangland, Vamp Willow takes the same stroll. The street is full of color and humans, and Vamp Willow's confusion is as marked as Cordelia's. Later, Vamp Willow is locked into the book cage in another parallel to the Wish. Only this time, it is the vampire who is tortured by Cordelia with her one-side discussion of the ethics of boyfriend stealing. I love that parallel between Cordelia and Vamp Willow. That is it for this episode, other than spoilers and foreshadowing. I hope you'll hang around for that. If not, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you will come back next Monday for Enemies, where Angelus might be back. And we are back for spoilers. We have Willow floating this pencil, which just seems like it's there for this fun joke about her losing emotional control. But in the episode Choices, when she's captured by Faith and the Mayor, Willow will float a pencil and stake a vampire with it. And of course, the reference to emotional control, how it relates to magic, will reverberate throughout the series. The most clear reference is in Something Blue when Willow, grieving the loss of Oz, does a spell that inadvertently causes great chaos. Also, before that, Giles suggests that she shouldn't do magic because of her emotional state, and she's really angry and feels like he's saying she should be punished for Oz leaving and feeling bad about it. But what happens in the episode suggests that probably that is something to be concerned about. In later episodes, we will see Willow doubling down on using magic to deal with, or perhaps more accurately, to avoid her feelings. And eventually, we'll see that metaphor of magic as an addiction. So a lot foreshadowed by that reference to emotional control. Of course, Bored Now, I think I talked about this during The Wish Also a spoiler for when Willow becomes Dark Willow. The reference to Willow saying she thinks she's kind of gay. I'm pretty sure Willow uses these words to describe herself later. A really fun minor spoiler is Sandy, the girl that Willow bites in the bronze. In season five, Riley will meet Sandy in a bar. She will uh, flirt with him. He will recognize her as a vampire and say her name a couple times, Sandy. So a nice Easter egg for the fans who remember Sandy from Doppelgangland. This idea that the vampire does relate to the human's personality or the human informs the vampire here it seems like just a funny line but we will see this more and more as Buffy goes on especially with Spike in the episodes where we learn about Spike's past he is uh, or was as a human a poet a romantic he was very devoted to his mother and we'll see that when he becomes a vampire and changes his mother into one His actions are still driven by those very human emotions. So I really like that this show decided to explore that. How how do these personalities, how do these uh, humans connect with the vampire selves later? So that is it for spoilers. Thank you again for listening. 
And uh, thank you to all of you who support the show on Patreon or by sharing it or tweeting about it or commenting. It really means a lot to me and helps me keep the energy to continue, which I will do next week when we talk about enemies, where Angel punches Xander and Buffy learns more about the mayor. Music for this episode was composed and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC, copyright 2020. All rights reserved.